It's your Locked On of Flyers podcast for Thursday, January 12th. Your daily dose of Flyers news, analysis, and high quality content that is very happy to be talking about a Flyers win on my birthday, Russ. Yeah, it's a great birthday present. Uh, we're going to also talk about the upcoming NHL draft and kind of give ourselves a, a primer on it with Russ's first rankings list uh, all that and more on today's show your locked on flyers your daily podcast on the philadelphia flyers part of the locked on podcast network your team every day Hey there, I am Rachel Donner. You can find me on Twitter at rmiriam. I'm here as always with prospect expert Russ Cohen, who's on Twitter at Sportsology. Thanks for making us your first listen every day. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Lockdown Flyers. That is where you'll keep up with the Flyers news and our episodes, all that good stuff. And you can also email the show at LockedOnFlyers at gmail. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Locked on Flyers is free and available on Apple, Spotify, Odyssey, wherever you listen to podcasts. So subscribe. You'll get all of our episodes here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Plus, we're over on YouTube. So subscribe there as well. Russ, uh, I I was a little nervous there for a minute, but they managed to actually shut it down in the end. And I think that's the important part that, you know, the Caps got themselves back into this game, but the the Flyers managed to recover from that. And it's a good lesson for them. It it was. I mean, I'm not sure we knew when when Owen Tippett scored that goal and it was a nice goal that that was going to be like a key goal. Um, but it turned out to be, uh, you know, Travis Konechny has a great game. It is kind of weird. It's only his second career hat trick. Like you would think he would have more than that, but at least he got it. And that's good. It did almost collapse in though at the third period. And if you look in like, you know, Washington's own percentage was something like 66%. So, yeah, you know, those are the things where, uh, if you didn't have Carter Hart at the absolute top of his game, it was going to go to overtime. Like it definitely was going to overtime. So that's one where I think Carter Hart, you know, absolutely stole it. And I think the Flyers, you know, played really, really solid for two and a half periods. But, you know, it got a little, right. they, they, they ran out a little gas or something or the focus just wasn't there. I'm not sure. Yeah. Also, the Washington Capitals are a good hockey team. And right. They can, and they eventually they can through. respond themselves. So yeah. I think that. You know, if, if you put that together with, you know, a couple key mistakes that the Flyers made that the Caps were able to take advantage of, you know, that that's how they got their way back into it. But ultimately, I think, you know, the other good thing, other than the response from, you know, almost having the game tied back up again, was that, you know, there were, it was a group effort, I think, yes. in this one. There was, you know, while Travis Konechny did have the hat trick, uh, I think that, you know, so many people contributed to this game in different ways. I thought Noah Cates had another really solid game and was really good with puck protection. Yeah, he was when he buzzing. needed to. Yeah, really, really good effort there. I, Owen Tippett didn't just score the goal. I mean, he was drawing penalties. He like, drew penalties. You know. That was good. Yeah, that was a good thing. Yeah, I was um, impressed with Cates. Cates you know, continues to to do really well. The thing about Cates is, is he in the best spot yet? I don't know. That's the thing I think they need to figure out is maybe there's better line mates for him. Maybe there's a better spot for him because I feel like when he plays a game like that but doesn't really, can't really get something tangible on the scoreboard, that's when I think you have to think about it. Yeah, I mean, I think they're kind of hesitant to change anything up because they're, they've been so successful recently and and that's part of the the problem as well. But I I do think it's also good for him that he's just been able to do his thing really well. Mm -hmm. And he's not in any risky situations at the moment. 
Um, I, I also, you know, want to give stick taps to Scott Lawton, man, he, you know, getting that power play goal and then making that really tough effort to get TK the puck for the empty netter. I think, you know, he contributed a, a lot to this win as well. Yeah, no, no doubt for, for Lawton, a, a great game. See, that's the, that's the problem here. Lawton can play up and play 2C, and if Cates plays up and is a 2C, then it takes away almost all of his offense because it's very hard for him to to play there too. He could be a 2C down the road, probably never, but but could be, and we know Lawton isn't, and because Kevin Hayes can't play center, see, this is the, the problem that it, it, there would be so much more solved if they could do that, but, you know, these guys are pretty flexible as far as, you know, being versatile, and that's good. You do feel bad for Travis Konechny, too, because ever since Kevin Hayes got voted an all-star, he's had a couple of good moments, but Konechny scored a bucket full of goals, and it's going to look stupid that he's not on the all-star team. Yes, that that is most definitely <laughs> true. But I, I also think that there's a shot, because there's always a couple of guys that drop out, right? Sure. So I think Travis Konechny is high on the NHL's list. Should there be a, a Metropolitan Division dropout? I bet mm -hmm. he gets the replacement. I don't know if he gets it on votes because Flyers fandom doesn't seem that motivated on voting no, this year. No, they don't. So, uh, but I would guess that he's pretty high on the NHL's list for replacements. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's something to that. And I'll say... Definitely offensively, it was one of um, Travis Sanheim's better games for not getting a point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and he also had uh, a couple of really good defensive plays yeah. as well. You know, there's one where he dove in front of the puck, and there's yeah, that was Tony good... D'Angelo made that good stick move. Uh, Sanheim was there on support as well. Like, he yeah. got back as well. So I, uh, I liked his play uh, Sanheim's more specifically. And I think Tony D'Angelo has sort of recovered a little bit from the mistakes that he made that got him benched. Um, I, I feel like, you know, he's, he is what he is, but I, I think the last couple of games have been a lot better from him. Yeah. And, and I'll be honest, I'm not sure why Patrick Brown's here anymore. I mean, do they really need Patrick Brown at the NHL level? There's really nobody that they could bring up and put somebody else at 4C, I, I think if they look at it, they could. I just, it doesn't yeah. seem like they need him on the team. Well, I, I do think he's very replaceable, let's yeah. say that. But I, I just, I think for now, for that fourth line in the usage that they're getting, you know, he's fine. He'll do. I, I, I'm not sure who they would bring up in that kind of role right now. That's yeah, I don't know. the question um, for me. There's a guy who has initials. Two A's, Artem Anisimov. Well, <laughs> who would, would you have rather have, Rachel? Contract. Well, but so, I mean, but if they want to make their team yeah. better, you know. No, that's true, and I I just don't know that they want to make their team better in that way. With in what you know, way? There's no other has... way. Either you make it better or you don't. That is true, but I, I'm just saying in terms of you know a guy like Anisimov you're you're not going to like count on him for the long term right and you aren't for for brown either but i'm saying like if you're bringing up somebody why aren't you bringing up somebody who's going to be part of the flyers future in this kind of proto rebuild mode yeah i'm not sure there's anybody for that role yet but i could just say that right. the team would be better with anisimov and at least Hey, you can make yourself better. Like it's just because again, they're they're too far gone to worry about you know tanking or anything. So to me, it's like make yourself better. Like you've got this guy in the AHL. Like give him his NHL break. I mean, what if? I mean, you don't know. Like again, what if he came up and he started scoring buckets of goals? Then you might want to keep him and sign him for the next year, and then you would have something. But you don't know if you don't actually do it. Like they got him trapped in Lehigh. Yeah, I, I think it'll be interesting to see as the season progresses, especially if they want to try and get the Phantoms into a playoff position. Uh, you know, we've talked about that a little. If they're going to want to keep an Asimov down there as long as possible, I, I don't know. But it's certainly a good question to ask uh, moving forward. And uh, I think that 
moving forward and looking forward is something that we should be doing right now. And to do that, we're going to start talking about the NHL draft and how Russ goes about putting together rankings. It's super interesting. And we'll bring that to you next. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting information, stats, news, and analysis. You can get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from football to basketball, soccer, esports, and of course the NHL. We've got it all at BetOnline.net. And if you love sports podcasts like ours, you can find those at Bet Online as well. We're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fix so head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more bet online where the game starts make sure you check out locked on nhl prospects your daily show covering the next generation of hockey superstars leading up to the nhl draft plus rankings and top prospects comparison for every team it's available wherever you get your podcasts Uh, that was a very apt promo we just did for our sister show uh, locked on nhl prospects because we're talking about the draft right now and uh, it is that most glorious time of year where rankings start to come out in a more methodical way for the upcoming nhl draft Russ, you are our prospect expert on this show and this network, I would say. You're uh, pretty up there as it as it goes. And so you have your first uh, top 32 for 2023 that you put out on sportsology.com. And I I thought it'd be great for us to talk about your process so we can get Mm -hmm. some more insight into how you do rankings and, you know, what's that line in the sand that puts somebody in the four slot versus the five slot and and all of those things. So uh, let's, let's start with that. Like what's your approach to, to ranking these guys? Well, it's funny because my approach is the same every year, but it starts earlier than the draft. So like as an example, if I'm starting to see 2024 guys in the world juniors, I'm already putting notes down. If I'm seeing 2024 guys in the ushl at the fall classic this year i'm already putting them on next year's list so by the time you know i hit start looking at the 2024 draft i might have you know 10 12 names already on the list so i i'm a firm believer that live views are the best right any live views you can get trump right. anything but of course i don't have the budget to be able to do live views like a real nhl scout uh, for a team or even, you know, a scout for a scouting service that, that that's their only thing. So I'm lucky I could supplement. So my basic process is live views first video second. And then I also, uh, like to talk to as many of the draftees as I can third. And I, a lot of those articles go up on, on elite prospects. And I feel like on the, um, the talking side, I feel like is a missed thing in the prospect world because, I like to sort of see what the makeup of a player is. I have certain questions I want to ask them. I want to see what I could learn from them, what they could teach me, what they could tell me about other players. There's a lot to learn from me on these interviews besides giving, you know, promotion to the player. Right. I I think that's a, a huge part of what you do that I personally appreciate just because, you know, when you talk about what, a guy thinks maybe he needs to work on or what he thinks he excels at. It's really good to compare that to what you're seeing out there on the ice, because as they progress, you know, through that career time, you know, say you're just starting to scout 2024. Now, you know, you can see the change and you'll know what they think they need to work on. So you can look for those specific things. Yeah. Like progression is one of the biggest things that, that I go with. So, If I have previous notes on a player like Adam Fantilli, I have notes that go back to when he was playing with uh, Chicago in the USHL. So I go back and I look Mm -hmm. at those notes and I match them up to what he's doing this year. And I could see a difference in the player. And, and for me, that's a, that's a nice little glimpse. Now, sometimes it's still incomplete. Like with a guy like Brad Lambert, you know, last year, it was still sort of incomplete, but at least on some of the others, you could really connect the dots and you could really see sometimes you see where the player grew, sometimes meaning an actual growth spurt, because we have to remember 
at 17 and 18, you could still grow. Like um, a lot of people, this is a true story. <laughs> a lot of people did not recognize me when I came back from my senior year in high school, because when I left that summer, I was about eh, five, four, something like that. And when I came back, I was like five, nine. Um, so I had a nice growth spurt and they didn't recognize me, some people, you know, and so that was something where, you know, I I kind of recognize that with players. I also kind of ask them about their parents. I look up their bloodlines when I can, because I think sometimes it matters. Sometimes you could see that, hey, you know, this guy's father or mother are tall and he hasn't he's only five ten. He's probably gonna grow a little more. There's things that you could sort mm -hmm. of, you know, be small little hints that might help me move around a player on a list. So, you know, given you're following these players for a decent stretch of time, we're now in January, you know, the drafts in the summer. Is this enough time between now and then for any of these guys to make a significant dent in what their rankings are? Yeah, because they're going to start playing in more showcase games and then eventually more um, games that really matter, like playoff games. So. To me, those have so a it's higher... more about the visibility than it and well, for more some players getting eyes on them. Some players, like some players, it's more about visibility. Like someone like Will Smith, who no matter what is going high in this draft, he didn't play in the World Juniors, right? He was sick. He would have been right. on the team otherwise. So the visibility hurt him then. Uh on Monday, he'll be at the All American Prospects game, and a hundred or more scouts will get a chance to see, you know, what he looks like now since he was sick, right? So that That'll rebound mm -hmm. that for him. So, yeah, visibility is a thing, but I also, you have to see how players play under duress and play in pressure situations. That's a big thing for me. I have to see if players score clutch goals. I have to see if that's a trend. You know, like a player like Jordan Eberle, all up the ladder, scored a lot of clutch goals in the world juniors and even in the pros he's he's scored quite a few he hasn't you know he's maybe not been the player some people thought he would be based on the world juniors that's fair but he does seem to come through in the clutch there are things like that that you can look at and unfortunately uh stat wise if you're just looking online like this chl is not good with stats they don't really right they don't really allow you much and it really kind of stinks i would like to see you know the whole canadian hockey league be more visible with that but they're not so luckily I, I can go to Instat, a stat service, and they have a lot more stats. That's why a lot of times I quote them on the show because I could see other things. I could get ice time where some of these leagues won't even give you ice time. Uh, you know, NCAA included. Uh, sometimes it's hard to find ice time. So I those all, all these things I, you know, I have to look at. I look at, you know, as much video as I can all throughout the year. Like I, you know, I always have my notes and even this first rankings uh, years ago, I wouldn't even do one until March, but the demand has become so great. And I remember even Kevin Allen saying to me, like, you have to start doing them earlier. You just have to, like, that's what people want. And I'm like, right. all right, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to change sort of, so like my rule now is never before the world juniors simply because right. that's, that's a, a big, huge differentiation point. It is. It's a big, and if you do it before then, fine. Because if you have like scouts everywhere, I get it. It's okay. I mean, I can't be in the queue and in the dub and in all these places all before the World Juniors anyhow. And sometimes I don't get there in a calendar year. So I can only pick and choose certain things I can go to. So that's where I say World Juniors is great because a lot of them come to that one tournament. And then I can continue from there because I'm always going to watch games and a lot of uh, shift footage from those other leagues especially that i'm not as familiar with now what what always what's always funny about it is like someone will say well what do you think of Saginaw this year and I say honestly i'm just tracking some players from there i don't really track the league and how they do even ncaa hockey where i go and cover uh not until the east regionals do i really start looking at teams just because i write for different sites that maybe that you know that works out for so a lot of times i'm just focused on players on teams so looking at this year's crop, just from a big picture perspective, not necessarily individually, um, one of the big outlets for guys uh, to get, you know, a lot of visibility and sort of the best of the best on the U.S. side 
is the national team development program. Yeah. What do you think of this year's crop overall, maybe relative to last year, which was a big year? I think this year's crop stacks up really, really well. They, and I think they might be better. Uh, I don't, you know, from a star power perspective, maybe not, but from a overall depth one, Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where this one is really good. They're the ones I pay attention to the most because, you know, I go to the fall classic every year. So I see uh, them play at least a couple of games there. Then I usually go to the all American prospects game. And a lot of times I can catch a regular season game of theirs plus what they play there. So I see them some more times there. And so, and world juniors, a lot of those guys are there too. So I see more NTDP than anybody uh, as far as, you know, draft year players. And that's why I try and catch up on the others. But it's it's a really good group. My struggle this year was I still have Will Smith ahead of um, Ryan Leonard. I think at times Ryan Leonard's actually a better player. But right now I went with Smith for the moment. But I want to kind of see towards the end of the year. Because Will Smith is, is a guy that's just got this tremendous speed and game-breaking ability and everything else. And then there's a part of me that says, can will all this ice be available to do this at the next level? Like, can he, whereas Ryan Leonard is a guy that, you know, is five eleven, but he's like ripped like a Jack Eichel and he's super strong mm -hmm. and he's plays tough in corners and he can get to the net. And if all things break down on the ice, he can get near the net and get his own scoring opportunities. And that translates really well to the NHL game. And it's the same thing as like Fantilli and Carlson. I have to sort of, you know, have this battle in my head. What, what I think is is going to be more transferable, who's going to, you know, have the bigger impact. So it's it's a lot of that. So, like, when people talk about the Russian factor, on rankings it doesn't matter on, because I'm only ranking what players I think are going to, you know, this is where they fall in line as far as talent. I'm not predicting where what team they're going to go to. Now, later in the year I will do a mock draft. I don't love them. I do one a year. That's it. And so – that will right. matter a lot on on that mock yeah. draft. In, in terms of like, are people still going to be reticent to pick Russians? Like, yes. what is and because they've been banned from international competition, what does that do for their ability to showcase themselves and, and all of that? Yeah, so you'll see. You know, I still have where I think Mitchkov belongs. Uh, I have him ranked fourth, and I think right now that's where he belongs. And so, does it mean he gets drafted fourth? No. A lot of times on a draft list, if you're within like five spots, you're doing pretty good. Does he go nine? Maybe. He might. He might still be in the top ten. I think there's a chance. It's probably a chance he could fall outside of it, but I don't think he will. Mm -hmm. So there's that. And then uh, also, you know, if you go further down, there's um, a defenseman, Simashev. And I have him in there, and I've got him at 18. So he's a defenseman who – you know, is playing in the KHL currently, or he's been going up and down. And so now that's a guy at 17. Does he go in the first round with the Russian factor? Maybe not. Maybe so not. So that's, you know, but a guy like Mitch Kopp, where it's undeniable and he could be a franchise player, it's going to supersede. But for another guy like Simashev, maybe not. All right. Well, we've got so much more to talk about and dig into the list itself. And we'll do that coming up next. Looking for a delicious treat, but don't want all the fat and calories? Then you got to try a Built Bar. We just go through the holidays, and I know my goal is to eat a little healthier this year. If you're like me, where you want to eat healthier, but don't want to compromise taste, then man, I've just the thing for you. You've got to buy, try Built. With Built, healthy is actually tasty. Perfect for your New Year's resolution. What makes Built Bars so good? Well, for starters, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. And they come in unbelievably delicious flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, and coconut almond. And what's even better is that they're healthy. Only 130 calories and 4 grams of sugar with a whopping 17 grams of protein. And now you don't need to wait around to get a box. For years, we've been talking about ordering your Built Bars at Built.com. Now you can get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. That's right. Head to your nearest Walmart today, walk into the pharmacy section, and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You could pick up a four bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut puffs. If you're close to Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13 bar box with our hit flavors 
brownie batter, and churro. You can thank me later. All right. So your list, Russ, is uh, pretty interesting, I think, from from my perspective. Obviously, Connor Bedard is at number one. There's yeah. no question there. I don't think any but he would even think about not putting him at number one unless they're trying to be trouble. But uh, I <laughs> or think they're just for the looking for clicks, as we say. Yes, yes. So for the two three slot, I know we talked about this briefly. Uh, we talked about Adam Fantilli on the show on October twentieth. If you want to go back and listen to our profile, then uh, we talked about Leo Carlson last week, January fifth, and we did talk a little bit about you know, what's the decision that scouts and you know draft experts are going to make, you know, between those two at two, three, you put Carlson above Fantilli. Why? So I believe he'll be a center. And even though he's playing wing, like at the world juniors or whatever, I, I think he, he has the traits to be able to play center. So I look at that, uh, you know, watching him at the world juniors, maybe digging more into his regular season games again, and see what I was looking at. And, you know, the from a, a production standpoint, Fantilli's doing great in the NCAA. Don't get me wrong. He's having a, just an unbelievable year. Guys don't put up numbers like he does all every day. But Carlson's putting up some really strong numbers in the SHL, which most of us regard as like the second best league in, in the world. So you look at that and you say, all right, that's something. Then I also look at, well, you know, how are both guys going to, you know, get their points in the NHL. And I think Carlson has a little bit of a better ability to be able to get through traffic and get to the net. Fantilli may have um, better two-step quickness and a better shot, um, like a better wrist shot from from the, right. uh, let's say if they're doing it from the circles, while Carlson's is still really good. I mean, we're really splitting hairs. But, you know, how they're going to do it, uh, I think there was a little glimpse of that in the World Juniors, even though, again, uh, Fantilli is even younger. I, uh, they're both young. I'm not sure which is younger than which, but Fantilli is young for a college player for sure. And, you know, you saw some glimpses. I did see a little bit more uh, NHL transferable skills from Carlson. So I just, I right now, so too. yeah. So right now I'm giving him the edge. All right. Uh, I think, you know, obviously for Flyers fans, currently we're eighth in the Tankathon website and you know if you're looking around eight on your list uh, uh it's really interesting because right now you don't have a defenseman until the nine slot everybody above them are forwards and so do you really think a defenseman is isn't going to get picked until later or do you think that'll shuffle around based on team need and then where do you see kind of the flyers fitting in with a potential pick there I don't think – I think there's a chance that no defensemen go in the top 10. I think there's a, a very good chance of that. Uh, I like Ac Axel Sandin Palika a lot. Had a yeah. chance to speak to him. I had a chance to sort of break down what's been happening to him the last few years. It was very helpful. He was shocked that there was this much hype about him, which I found, I found uh, redeeming. But I also saw that – they also had the faith in him in the World Juniors to use him on the power play, and he looked good. So there's a lot of things there, but does that make him a top-pairing defenseman? I don't think so. So I don't think there's a guaranteed bona fide. Now, it doesn't mean he can't get there. With you know, If he had great coaching and he really hits everything right, sure, he could get there. But I don't think there's a guaranteed bona fide top-pairing defenseman like this, the same way we thought Juracek was, as an example, on the same show on this show. So... I, I don't think defense is the way the Flyers want to go here. Uh, there's This is a very deep forward draft. There's definitely a lot of centers. Of the choices that I think will be out there, you know, it's possible they might go for Oliver Moore because he could play center or wing, and that would go well mm -hmm. with, with uh, Cutter Goche because they've not only played together, uh, but the fact is, we don't know if Gauthier will be a center or a wing either. So from a planning standpoint, that would kind of cover you. Uh, Andrew Cristal is a really good player. I mean, that would be, you know, I love Delabor Dvorsky. If he happens to fall, uh, 
some people, and again, I just think it's because of the country he's from, or like, is he the next Jura Slavkovsky? It's different. Right, because he's, he's also from Slovakia. Right. He's a different player. Uh, but I do like his skills a lot. I, I think we saw really good moments from him in the World Juniors. He had good moments last year. So he's another guy who's already got a pro body and can skate well, definitely can um, be a playmaker, but also be a goal scorer. So, you know, I would look for where if they're going to go at eight and I'm assuming Smith will be gone and Benson will be gone. Uh, I, I, I'd i say, you know, if you went with Kristal Moore or Dvorsky, you'd be doing pretty well. I wouldn't mind them picking Palika and, you know, maybe if they trade Ivan Provorov, they're going to think like maybe we should because uh, he's only a couple of years away since he's playing in the SHL, you know, maybe, but there's a picture of him on sportsology uh, that I took of him and you could see he's got a frame that you could add to the similar to maybe like what a Noah Dobson was with the, uh, with the Islanders. But the only thing is you can see he's pretty lean right now. And so, you know, I think two to three years, cause he is going to have to, you know, just get a little bit more muscular, not a lot, but he's going to have to mm-hmm. put on a little muscle He's definitely going to get more man strength. All the other skills are there. So I wouldn't be upset with him either. All right. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, Oliver Moore is once a uh, notch above Ryan Leonard, who we've talked about on yeah. the show. We talked about him uh, November 17th, if you want to go back and listen. Um, and it's because and, of speed. Moore's just got this right. crazy good speed. Yeah. Cool. Well, we have so much more to dig into with this list of prospects. We got months until the draft. And so uh, really excited to keep talking about a lot of these guys, some of which we've mentioned, some we haven't so far. You can look at the whole list at sportsology.com. We'll put a link in the show notes there. If there's anybody that you're interested out there in us talking about sooner rather than later, please let us know. And uh, we will make sure to prioritize them in our prospect profiles that we do pretty much every week on the show. And uh, we'd be happy to do that for any of you. So you can um, email that to us, lockdownflyers at gmail. You can send us a DM on Twitter at lockdownflyers. And uh, we'll be happy to talk about the prospects of your choice. Uh, We will be back on tomorrow's show with a Flyers midseason report. And we're going to talk about what the Flyers need to do against the Caps next. I'm Rachel. I'm on Twitter at rmiriam. That's R-M-I-R-I-A-M. I'm Russ. I'm at Sportsology, S-P-O-R-T-S-O-L-O-G-Y. Thanks for making Locked On Flyers your first listen today. For your next listen, check out Locked On NHL Prospects, your daily podcast covering the next generation of hockey superstars. It's available wherever you get your podcasts. Have a great day, everyone.